Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our monthly virtual series, Conversations with Community. Uh, my name is Dr. Angelo Moore. I lead the Office of Health Equity for the Duke Cancer Institute. And the title of today's um, event is Barbershop Talk. Let's have a man-to-man -man conversation about prostate cancer. And we have a great uh, program scheduled for you, for, scheduled for you today. Um, here's a quick agenda of what's gonna be covered. Uh, just a quick introduction, which we'll be doing right now. I'll also tell, tell you a little bit about some of the organizations that are here participating. Uh, Dr. Robinson is gonna have a presentation on prostate cancer. Uh, and then we'll have the panel discussion. The panel discussion, uh, we have three panelists and I will introduce them right before the panel. And after the panel, uh, we'll have probably about a five minute Q&A session. And I encourage you throughout this presentation that you'll put any questions that you have in the chat. We may not have the opportunity to answer all your questions, uh, but we'll try to answer them. And if you leave a contact information, uh, we'll try to get those responses to you. And at the end, um, I'll have some phone numbers and an email address uh, that you can get in contact with us after the program. And at the end, we'll also have some resources and uh, tell you about a couple of upcoming, service, uh, upcoming events that we have in the next month or so. So just so you all know, uh, the Duke Cancer Institute Office of Health Equity, we are the leader when it comes to cancer disparities. And we do this by reaching out to our community, engaging with our partners, uh, going out in the community, getting information and knowledge from the community, making sure that we are providing that information to our scientists and researchers to help uh, with our programs, help develop our research programs so we actually impact in our community in a positive way. Now, we have different ways on how we do that, you know, community outreach and engagement, which is part of what we're doing right here. A lot of times we're out in the community, we're educating people on how to prevent cancer, tell them about their risk factors, helping them get screening, as well as if they have an a, a abnormal screening to help them get diagnostic testing and treatment if they do have cancer. Uh, in our office, we have community facing navigation. These are the navigators that help individuals get their, uh, the care that they need. And we also work with individuals even though they do not have health insurance. And what we do is we try to see what programs they may be available to have. Health disparities education. And part of this is health disparities. And we know for African-American men, we are more than twice as likely to die from prostate cancer. So this is a very important topic for us. Uh, we also do education on clinical trials and workplace diversity. And so the Men's Health Council of Durham County, which I'm also a part of, and we have a member on the panel today that is, uh, will be speaking. Uh, and the goal is to reduce health disparities by engaging men in our communities with the greatest health inequities. Um, very focused on men. And we know as men, uh, a lot of men don't get the care that they need, uh, but we're trying to change that. And our mission is to educate, inspire, and lead men and boys in Durham County to live better lives. And we do this through multiple ways we have. Uh, walks in the community uh, to get physically active. We have health forms and presentations. Uh, we have experts to come in. We also have the disease prevention and management workshops. And this is part of what we do as well. We also have two members on the panel that's part of the Duke Cancer Institute's Community Advisory Council. And this advisory council consists of community members from public and private sectors that's in our surrounding catchment area, which is more than Durham County, but we, we serve approximately 41 counties in the state of North Carolina. Um, and they have very important roles. They have very uh, diverse backgrounds and they also provide information to give the community voice and community perspective on what's needed in the community so we can help uh, develop and inform our research programs. They also provide us guidance on what is the best way to reach our population, as well as uh, with our program and what programs are important to our community. So I'm gonna introduce our first presenter and this is uh, Dr. Kerry Robinson. And Dr. Robinson, uh, he received his medical degree uh, from Tulane University School of Medicine. He completed residencies at the University of Oregon Health Center, as well as Duke University, as well as he conducted a, re, uh, a residency in urologic surgery at Duke University. 
He completed two uro urologic uh, fellowships at the National Cancer, to, uh, National Cancer Institute. And he's board certified in urology by the American Board of Urology. He's a urologic oncologist who is specifically trained in surgical management of cancer. Now, his patience is a favorite part of his job. Uh, he hails from Louisiana. Um, and one thing I would like to know, those that may be familiar, the uh, Duke Cancer Institute Office of Health Equity have what we call men's health screening event. Normally it's done in September of every year. We've had to postpone it this year due to the increased positive rates of COVID and hospitalizations. But Dr. Robinson is the person who developed that program that's about 26 years ago, which allows men to come in and get free prostate cancer screening. That's what it started out as, but since then we've added other screenings uh, to that particular event, um, such as um, colon cancer screening. Uh, we also do HIV AIDS. Uh, we also do um, hepatitis B, uh, as well as diabetic uh, screening and hypertension. And so we've added a plethora of other screenings because we know that you know, there's some chronic diseases that men need to manage uh, in order to be more healthy. And also outside of his job, he enjoys fishing, golfing, and spending time with his wife. So at this time, uh, I introduce you to Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Well, thank you, Angelo, and welcome everybody. This is uh, really a great pleasure to spend time in this sort of modern era of uh, webinars and Zoom conferences. And it's really a wonderful opportunity to kind of bring things up to focus in terms of this one problem, prostate cancer, which I think is, as I say here, it's really once you begin on that journey, it's a lifetime journey. Uh, next slide, please. So in the United States, prostate cancer is a common cancer in men. As a matter of fact, it's the second most common cancer in men. Um, and treatments include radical prostatectomy, radiation therapy, cryotherapy, which is a freezing type therapy, HIFU, which is an ultrasound therapy, high intensity focused ultrasound. Uh, these are the therapies approved by the FDA, as well as just observation of what we call active surveillance of low-grade cancers, formerly called watchful waiting. Next slide. So there are about 250,000 cases of prostate cancer diagnosed in this country annually, which is not dissimilar from breast cancer, just a point of reference. Uh, and about one in six men in their lifetime will be diagnosed either a low-grade, intermediate, or high-grade malignancy. Again, very similar to breast cancer. Now, the most common treatment for this is radical surgery or radical prostatectomy, which has been practiced in this country since 1903. And historically, across the board, we have an average cure rate of about 70%. However, if you break that down into low risk disease, that's about a 95% cure rate, intermediate risk disease, about an 80% cure rate, and a high risk disease, about a 50% cure rate. So, Again, we'd like to find cancers early and treat them uh, at the right time. We can also predict outcome after treatment based on the level of um, prostate-specific antigen, otherwise called PSA. It's a protein produced by prostate cells specifically. We would like to know that, that number prior to diagnosis. At the time of biopsy, we can actually look under the microscope and look at the organization of a tumor if it's a very well-organized tumor, then that's a low-grade tumor. If it's poorly organized, um, it's a high-grade tumor. And then again, the P stage, that P means pathological stage, and T means the size of tumor. So when the prostate is actually removed, it's possible to evaluate the tissues and see if the tumor was confined to the gland or confined to the tissue that was removed, or did it extend to the edge of the specimen? So we call that the P stage. Um, and then are there any trends going to a higher cure rate? Well, yes, um, we're seeing that even though 15% of tumors are detected are high grade and high risk and potentially lethal, we know that we catch those tumors at a really small volume, we have a much greater chance of eliminating the disease. So the message here is screening and early detection are actually the best strategy for achieving a cure in prostate cancer. Next slide. 
So if you look at the fact that we have an aging population and that baby boomers in particular are beginning to be um, a dominant factor in our society, we also have octogenarians becoming a very significant factor in our society. And the sweet spot here is to learn when and how to screen for prostate cancer when it really does make a difference. So the American Urologic Association has looked at this issue from multiple directions and we basically recommend screening for prostate cancer beginning around 55 to around 70, unless you're in a uh, adverse risk population, and that would include African-American men, also men that have a positive family history. We recommend in those men that we begin actually looking for early prostate cancer a bit earlier than 55 and possibly a little bit past age 70. Next slide. Um, yes, and that just points out the fact that we're now in the 2020 to 2030 range, and we're on an exponential increase in the number of individuals getting into this upper age limit. And I would say that as men age, their risk for cancer in general goes up, and the cancers that do develop in the men over 70 tend to be slightly more aggressive than in the men under age 70. Next slide. So while we say that prostate cancer early detection is really effective, it's only as effective as the treatment. And we know that radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy has been practiced for many years and is clearly effective when the tumor is confined to the prostate. However, if there's tumor extending beyond the prostate into the tissues under the bladder or into the muscles on the pelvis, um, we're not 100% successful in every case at getting rid of the local disease. And also those tumors tend to be a bit more likely to spread silently to, to lymph nodes or other parts of the body, bone marrow. Uh, and you wouldn't even know that because we can't image that until it gets those, those sites become larger. So again, again, the message there would be an early detection program will identify a greater percentage of patients who have tumors confined to their prostate. It's also very important to know that clinically significant and poorly controlled tumors can be detected as well. What I mean by that is we do know that about 50% of men age 50 and up when just examined, let's say you had an unfortunate premature death, heart disease or car crash, and those prostates and those unfortunate gentlemen were actually carefully evaluated under the microscope pathologically we'll find microscopic evidence of low-grade prostate cancer in about half those men. So those are not considered clinically significant as tumors. Just think of those as dormant sites of disease that can become active at a later time. What we're really talking about is we're talking about small tumors that are going to get bigger over time. And we can find those by screening with blood testing and also by you know, radiology testing and biopsy. And when we find those, we call those clinically significant tumors because we know they will get bigger over time. So then we begin on a path of counseling and talking about, let's treat these tumors at the right time with the right technique, get the best result. Unfortunately, we know that the men that are highest risk sometimes are also subject to healthcare disparities like Black and African-American men. And it's not sure, it's not really clear if the increased death rate, which is twice as likely compared to white men, um, is secondary to lack of access or is it genetic? And I think it's a little bit of both. And we actually have active research going on at Duke and other institutions throughout the country and the world to understand the genetics and genomics of these tumors in different populations of men. We know that black and African-American men have the highest prostate cancer death rate among all US populations. So this is why we're focused on this population. Next slide, please. Now at the Duke Prostate Center, which started in 2007, uh, under the direction of Dr. Judd Mao, when he came to us from Walter Reed Army Medical Center in DC, um, we started off with three specialty areas, surgery, radiation oncology, and medical oncology. Just to refresh your your uh, knowledge. Medical oncology are really basically gentlemen or lady physicians who prescribe medication to treat cancer, whereas the surgical <clears throat> treatment of cancer is technical 
and either the use of energy sources directly into the prostate or the removal of tissue. And in the middle, we see radiation oncology, which is really the administration of radiation, uh, which is an invisible source of uh, radiation, just like the radiation that comes from the sun, that's invisible. It will be directed and focused onto the prostate and will denature the DNA and will in, you know, make the tumors um, die a slow uh, death. Um, so we believe that in this prostate center, we formed a very coordinated program, which includes multidisciplinary clinics. Uh, every other Friday, we have patient appointments that those patients can see all three specialists in the same clinic setting. If once they've been diagnosed with cancer and they have what we consider a significant disease. Um, and then we also have expanded our program, not only in Durham County, but to Wake County over at Duke Regional Hospital in Wake, uh, Duke, Durham County, and also Duke Raleigh Hospital in Wake County. And we know that this population in this area is growing at a rapid rate, and we would love to reach out to all of these populations and make them aware that we do have a very coordinated focused project and program in prostate cancer. Um, next slide, please. So here we have a picture of an airplane and on the airplane that is the title PSA, which uh, interestingly enough is a small commuter airline subsidiary of American Airlines headquartered out of Dayton, Ohio. <clears throat> but it just points out the fact that PSA has many meanings. And, and for us, it means prostate specific antigen. Antigen is just a technical term for protein. So what is PSA? PSA is actually an enzyme which helps to liquefy congealed secretions from the prostate. It actually is produced in large quantities by small tumors. So it's similar to um, looking at the blood as an indication that there may be cancer present. Now, you can have inflammation or infection in the prostate and have an increased absorption of PSA into the blood, which will raise the PSA blood level artificially. We actually have some situations where competitive cyclists who are on the bicycle seat for hours at a time weekly sometimes have ele elevated PSA just from physical irritation of the prostate. So the PSA is a, a protein that literally leaks out of the prostate, is picked up in the bloodstream, so it can be falsely elevated. It doesn't mean you have cancer, but it's like this. If you had 100 men uh, that had an elevated PSA and you chose not to biopsy or investigate any of those men, you would miss 30 men out of 100 that had prostate cancer. And about half those men would have clinically significant cancer. So we tend to overreact to PSA and that can create some confusion and some anxiety. So this is where we have counseling and we provide the information prior to screening as to whether the individual that wants to get the PSA understands that, the, you know, this may be a slightly elevated number. It doesn't mean you have cancer. We just need to, need to check into things. Next slide, please. So we also know that the PSA level tends to go up as the prostate size increases. And between age 20 and age 70, the prostate gland on average doubles in size. <clears throat> and we know that those PSA normal levels will actually be higher in an older age population than in a younger age population. And recently, <clears throat> the guidelines for prostate cancer screening have been uh, changed and have been modified. And we know that men over 60 uh, that have PSAs greater than three should really go to a urology a center and be evaluated for possible prostate cancer. And fortunately, most of those men will not have prostate cancer. But if we are looking to find the prostate cancers that matter, we must be seeing those patients. Next slide, please. So here we have something called the Duke Prostate Center age-adjusted PSA velocity. In other words, the rate of change over time. So PSA is not not a static number it actually increases slightly in the individual patient during their lifetime. But if the PSA rises rapidly, let's say in two to three years, it doubles or triples, that can actually be a harbinger of something brewing. So we paid attention not only to the absolute number, but also the rate of rise of the PSA. Next slide, please. So the AUA has tried to get out in front of this and reduce any confusion 
And you can go into the AUA, that's the American Urologic Association uh, website, <clears throat> and look as a potential patient uh, into the resource material to learn more about prostate cancer. And since 2007, the um, AUA has been publishing a prostate cancer guideline for the clinical management of small tumors or what we call localized prostate cancer. Um, so this is just a depiction of this, this bro brochure. Next slide, please. Um, we know that many men, when they're diagnosed, are found to have low-grade disease that will smolder and not likely grow. Uh, and we know that over the last 30 years, we've seen a tendency to, to no longer aggressively treat these small tumors, but to watch them initially uh, to see if they will grow. We call this active surveillance. And here we see a, a paper from Walter Reed Army Medical Center uh, in the early 2000s, just describing the beginning in the 1990s, a number of patients were observed. <clears throat> and we can tell you that about 50% of men that go on initial active surveillance will eventually over a five to 10 year period proceed to a treatment. And many of those men just showed some growth. So PSA numbers increased, or maybe a biopsy that was repeated showed increasing amounts of cancer. So this, those men can then proceed to treatment and they really will do just as well as if they had had the treatment early on. And this is a way to temporarily defer treatment, preserve quality of life and maintain the activity of the patient, even though they're being carefully observed. Next slide, please. So here we go, this uh, graph depiction of survival. What does that mean? <clears throat> well, these are just graphs of different techniques of treating prostate cancer. Brachytherapy basically means putting in radioactive pellets into the prostate. Um, EBRT means external beam radiation therapy, or that's that invisible beam that's focused on the prostate. And then prostatectomy is self-explanatory, surgical removal of the prostate. <clears throat> but each one of these little graphs represents a, a percent likelihood of no failure. In other words, what's the likelihood that these treatments will be successful? Well, you can see that there's a lot of clustering at the very tippy top of these graphs. And then there's some graphs that drop down. And that's really dependent on the grade of the cancer as well as the um, amount, the size of the cancer. Um, but the, the good news here is many of these treatments have almost identical success rates. That means you have a lot of choice as a patient and you can pick and choose the treatment that makes the most sense to you once you learn about the potential um, differences in the treatments. Uh, next slide, please. So about 25% of patients uh, on survey uh, in reference to prostate cancer diagnosis treatment um, have stated in, in various studies that they were negatively impacted by their prostate cancer diagnosis and treatment. And about 40% reported that their relationships with their partners, especially their sexual relationships, were negatively affected. So prostate can cancer has been called a couple's disease. And I bring this up because you're, you're thinking in your mind that cancer is something that can be really dangerous and scary. But what the urologists and the medical oncologists and radiation oncologists try to do is try to match the desire of the patient to avoid side effects with their desire to be cancer free. And so this is why we call this the couple's disease. Next slide, please. Because you can see it takes a lot of support to go through a life challenge. And we know there are plenty of life challenges in medicine, but prostate cancer is scary to men because their life will change, possibly, maybe not. And I think that's part of the reason we try to go through extensive counseling whenever we diagnose prostate cancer, because some of these treatments that we, uh, that we employ uh, are not as scary as you think. And I'll give you an example. For radiation therapy, very rarely will you develop urinary leakage until many, many years later, seven to 10 years later, potentially. And that's really only about 2% of patients. And about 50% of men who go through radiation therapy will slowly develop erectile dysfunction. Now with surgery, about two to 5% of men will have some persistent weak, weak uh, um, urinary control after surgery and after recovery. 
Um, and about 50% of men will have preserved erections, uh, but there'll be a slow recovery after the surgery. So it, can, it all comes down to education and explaining to patients what can they expect and what, you know, what are the processes to get better after a treatment. Now, in terms of cryotherapy and ultrasound therapy, really that's a very different kind of a new thing at Duke. Um, we've been using cryotherapy for about 15 years, and we've also been using high ultrasound therapy at Duke for about 15 years. Uh, and both those treatments offer unique advantages over surgery or radiation therapy. Um, and we're happy to talk about those a little later if needed. Next slide, please. So this is a book that was written by a wife. And the point is, there are a lot of little tips and tricks about how to recover sexual activity after prostate mentioned. cancer treatment. And it's important to understand, this is a little bit of a educational process, but it, we, have, we're, we have specialists in this area that can help um, men and couples um, re remain sexually active even after aggressive surgery or radiation therapy, hormone therapy, et cetera. So I think it's, it's something to learn about and not be afraid of. Next slide, please. So again, what are the issues? Well, everyone would love to have cancer cure, but what are the issues in, in reference to the cost that will cost the patient? And the two most common problems after uh, prostate cancer treatment are urinary control problems and erectile dysfunction, but there can also be some issues, particularly after radiation therapy, maybe the bowels are a little overactive, um, maybe there's a little scar tissue that builds up after radiation or surgery, and the patients have a hard time urinating. Um, so this, again, is outlined uh, in this uh, prostate cancer guide by the American Urologic Association. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and you can see uh, by these different technologies, there are all these little complications listed. And if you look at the graphs, you'll see the dots. And the dots represent a single paper. <clears throat> and you can, you can pick out, for instance, next slide. You can pick out, um, and here we have HIFU, the ultrasound therapy that's compared to these other technologies. Next slide, please. You can see in red where we're highlighting erectile dysfunction. And on the left side, you can see the percentage of papers that have uh, uh, patients that have that. Well, there's one paper that 60% of patients had erectile dysfunction after brachytherapy, and another paper only 20%. So you kind of have to take this with a grain of salt. But you can look generally at the different columns, and you'll see in prostatectomy, there are more papers published on prostatectomy, and there seem to be a higher incidence of erectile dysfunction with, uh, with uh, the EBRT or the radiation therapy, still a fair number of papers. And again, it's pretty well spread out. So generally, I just sort of give some, some average numbers. And with the ultrasound therapy, we also have erectile dysfunction depending on how much tissue is, is treated. And if we only treat part of the prostate, you typically have much less erectile dysfunction. It's usually only about 10%. But that's not the point. The point is to understand that it can be variable depending on the technique, the center, the surgeon, the treater, uh, the facility. Next slide, please. Here we have a, the, the discussion of urinary leakage or urinary control issues. And you can see with, with radiation therapy, it's not very common. With, with prostatectomy, the incidence as reported in this graph was somewhere around 15% but all men leak right after a prostatectomy and they may only leak for a week or two, but some men may leak longer, like three to four to six months. And then they get better with, radiate, with uh, physical therapy and with uh, ultrasound therapy, there's a very low leak rate, somewhere around two to 3%. Next slide, please. So to conclude the comments, we can start the symposium and discussion. Just remember, Early detection works and screening for early stage prostate cancer will improve the cure rate for any of the treatments chosen. Also identifying the high risk groups is essential because if you don't look for the, the tumors in the, in the populations of gentlemen at the highest risk for the tumors, you're gonna be missing some important uh, patients. And then you need to have coordinated screening and combine that with 
a discussion called informed decision making. So an informed decision making is the first process is to decide for the for yourself whether you want to get into a screening program. And you know, obviously, some men are very very anxiously uh, involved with their health and they want to know a lot of information. Other men aren't, uh, and sometimes the the decision to go through screening is sort of a family decision. So I kind of leave that up to the patient and their family. And when we have men who are quite uh, up in years, have multiple medical problems, that they may or may not meet the criteria for aggressive screening. So this is, a, again, the sweet spot is aged somewhere around 50 to around 70, 75. Awareness and education about treatment early detection actually saves lives. And finally, we have technology improvement all the time and new treatments are being developed continually. So it's important to recognize that it's okay to be diagnosed with cancer and you may fall into the category of active surveillance and as you're being surveyed, technology gets better. And if you do need a treatment in the future, it may be an actually better treatment. So there's nothing to be afraid of here, but it is important to take care of your health. Thank you very much. Dr. Robinson, thank you very much for that presentation. And hopefully uh, during our panel discussion, some of this information, these topics will be covered. So I want to introduce to you the three panelists that we have today. Our first panelist, his name is Demetrius Harvey. Uh, he graduated with the Bachelor of Science in Public Health Education from North Carolina Central University. Uh, he received a healthcare management certification from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Public Health. And he's been licensed in life and health insurance since 2001. And he also received his security designation uh, for investments in 2013. Demetrius is a financial, financial services professional at Harvey and Associates Financial Group, specializing in working with professionals and small business owners with investments and retirement planning. He is known for his work with the Black Men's Health Initiative, which is focused on a community competent prevention education and innovative interventions that help direct results of lowering the risk and improving the health status of black men. He serves to be a major player in reducing prostate cancer and other health disparities amongst black men. In his work as a member of the Duke Cancer Institute uh, Community Advisory Committee Council, I'm sorry, in his role as a member of the Smithfield Alumni Chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity, Help, uh, healthy cappers, he continues to promote prostate cancer screening and education. Our next uh, panelist is Mr. Jeff Dow. Uh, Mr. Dow is from Carthage, North Carolina. He graduated from Appalachian State University with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration and Information Systems. He has worked with the banking and finance industry for over 20 years. He's an experienced consumer and commercial loan officer. He has worked in community development, pre and post housing counseling, and assists low and moderate income individuals with down payment assistance programs. He specializes in church lending. He is a certified credit and housing counselor and experience, experienced at conducting financial educational workshops, dealing with budget, credit housing, financial planning, and other topics, which he has done for the past 15 years. It is an area he is very that's very dear to him because he understands the importance that credit and proper money management have on today's world, especially when you have unexpected life changes to happen. He has become an advocate for promoting men to make sure that they have annual physicals, get their PSA levels checked, and have a digital rectal exam done. He gets involved in the community outreach efforts to increase awareness and education to both men and women regarding prostate cancer and treatment options. Um, then we have Mr. Earl Manhattan. He was born in Jamaica before moving to Boston, Massachusetts. He received his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Massachusetts at Laurel. And he relocated to San Diego, California where he started his first job working for General Dynamics. He relocated to Los Angeles and worked for 10 years for Hughes Aircraft as a test engineer. He then worked at Rockwell International where he worked on the space station Freedom as a test engineer. He met his wife in California and he relocated to Virginia briefly before moving to North Carolina with his four children. He became a stay-at-home dad after leaving 
California. He became a, 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 a avid advocate for kids as well as for others. He is very active in this church and operated a summer enrichment camp for over 20 years at his church. He is currently a substitute teacher for Durham Public Schools and is a member of the Men's Health Council of Durham County. So welcome, gentlemen. Um, first of all, I would like for you all to take uh, one to two minutes just to tell the audience what is your relationship when it comes to prostate cancer? And if you're not speaking, if you would please turn your uh, microphone on mute. Thank you. We'll start with Demetrius. Good evening, everyone. So my, my affiliation with uh, prostate cancer actually is as being part of a caregiver. Um, so my father uh, is a prostate, two-time prostate cancer survivor. Um, he actually was diagnosed when I was in college. So I was about 20 years old. My dad actually was 41. So my dad had me when he was 21 years of age. So he had it at 41. And <clears throat> obviously it was a shock to the family. This is our first time having conversations about prostate cancer, not knowing much education about it. And it really changed the family dynamic in terms of how much hands-on work as a family we needed to do to change our lifestyle and environment to fit what just happened to a major provider of the family. And since then, since those that time has happened, I've just been um, an advocate about the education, about staying on top of it, because now I realize being an African-American man and my father being a prostate cancer survivor, my percentages just went up even higher. So I have to stay diligent and one of the ways that keep me staying diligent is being involved in talking about it and making sure men get those screenings. And that's how I initially got involved. Excellent. Now we'll go to Jeff. Good evening. Um, my uh, association with my prostate cancer is as a uh, patient uh, advocate. Um, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer back in 2016 and had the radical prostatectomy done in 2017. Um, and ever since I was diagnosed, um, it really made me want to educate myself more about prostate cancer because before that happened, I really didn't know uh, anything about it. I had never really thought about it. But um, after coming under that diagnosis, uh, especially uh, someone who um, you know, I had no, don't smoke, don't drink, had been an uh, athlete all my life. Uh, and then to be told that you have, you know, cancer was just, it was just stunning to me. And so uh, since that time, I've tried to, uh, like I said, educate myself about it and then, you know, try to find ways to share that information with other men as well as their spouses, because again, the caregivers uh, have a big part in that also. And so that's, um, you know, it's been my uh, mission to try to help educate and, and just do outreach for other people to help bring awareness and to promote them, making sure they do get their annual physicals done, uh, for men not to be afraid to have a digital rectal exam done, and, and you know, if necessary, you know, to uh, have that PSA level checked. And then, you know, again, depending on what the results are from that, the further steps that, you know, that can be taken, um, as they talk with their primary care physician about it. So, um, you know, I'm coming from a patient advocate standpoint. And again, I'm just wanting to try to do my part to bring awareness. Thank you, Jeff. And Earl? Yes, uh, good evening. <clears throat> well, uh, the importance of annual visit is so important. And let me just give credit to my doctor, uh, Dr. Barnes, who's my primary care doctor, who sent me when he, after she saw my, my PSE had elevated. And she sent me to Dr. Mole. And the first year Dr. Mole saw me, um, he did a digital exam and he sent me home. You know, he thought everything was looking good. Uh, he thought I could watch it based on what he saw. And the thing, the third year, he, 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 he did another test, digital test. And he, but he said, uh, good thing he's not cancerous. However, to be, to be at the safe side, <laughs> I want to do a blood test. And then obviously the blood test shows something different. And that's when he said, uh, it cannot, this, at this stage, it cannot be watched. And that's when I decided to do surgery. 
And so it's so important because I went in, you know, ready to run three miles. So that, that's a silent thing that you don't know about because I had no idea that, you know, this occur. So I went and had did some research until I, I made a decision. Uh, it was diagnosed uh, in this, this, this February. And I stayed focused with the doctor and did all the prerequisites that before the surgery in May. So my surgery was May 17th, 7th, May 19th. And when I returned back uh, July 19th, I had good news that uh, Dr. Ferrandino said um, it was not low, to, very low, to, um, almost zero. And so I will return in November. So what I would do, what I would recommend men to, uh, annual checkup is very important. And the, the PSA was, they, it would term as below 10 when I was treated. And so this is very important because this is a thing that shows no sign. And that's the importance of visitation to the doctor. Thank you. And so well. I am a testimony and I'm ready to always relate to uh, give them a testimony to men to, to encourage them to, to go test. We appreciate their, their, your uh, sharing your stories. And, you know, some men may not even know when they should test for prostate cancer, when to get screened or how to. And so, uh, but there are some men who do. However, a lot of men are fearful about the screening, you know, the digital rectal exam. And so what advice would you give men that are contemplating getting screening? They have a risk factor for prostate cancer, relatives and their family. However, how do you help them get over that fear for any one of you all? Well, you also want them to get over their pride in terms of being a manhood. And sometimes that's a problem. I've heard of people died because they don't want to, they think they're going to lose their manhood. So I said, just do, just go and do what for your health and for your family's sake. Excuse, I would say, um, I I agree uh, with Earl from that perspective, but I, I would also challenge men to think about <clears throat> their family dynamic. What what are, what are they their roles in their families? Um, are they providers? Are they caretakers? Are I mean, are they fathers? You know, are they husbands? Who, who are they? They're all those things. And, and to decide that a quick test is more important than making sure that you keep your position um, just from a prevention standpoint, or at least knowing to give your family a better chance for you to be a part of that family dynamic. I think that, I think that's, uh, I think that trumps your little pride there for a minute in terms of, of knowing the issue with that, because uh, I, I would challenge men to think about anybody, uh, especially a male figure in their family who passed and how the family dynamic had instantly changed and, and possibly never corrected itself. You know, how would you feel about that? Because it's going to happen with you. So, you know, think about your family in that sense. And I think that may help to find out what you really love and what's important to you to get over the pride of getting that exam. And one thing that I would want to um, say, I guess, more specifically to uh, Black men is just the fact that uh, we are at a much higher risk of developing prostate cancer and dying from it. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, was mentioned earlier was that, you know, we are 60% more likely to develop prostate cancer and twice as likely to die from prostate cancer. Um, also, uh, black men tend to get prostate cancer at a younger age. Uh, we tend to have a uh, more advanced diagnosis or disease when found, and also that uh, we tend to have a more severe type of cancer than other men. And so, again, it's important for black men to do the pre-screening. Um, you know, I know I think that it was mentioned at uh, age 55, but um, I've read in some places, even for myself, started at age 40, you know, and one thing uh, I would like to give a shout out to my primary care physician, Dr. Glover, is that um, because I had been with her for a number of years, I stayed with her for a long time, still with her, she had tracked my PSA level for like over the past 10 to 12 years, and she could see how it was slowly but surely elevating, and so when it got to that point of being over four, that's when she made the recommendation to me to 
go and have the biopsy done, which in turn did come back and, and show that I had prostate cancer. So um, I would just encourage you to um, men to highly, uh, you know, if you can keep your same primary care physician and develop a good relationship with them. And again, having that test done and your physical, make sure you're doing it on a regular basis. Uh, that is so key to, uh, you know, helping prevent or treat this disease. You all brought up some important points that I want to highlight. One is that, you know, we need to overcome the fear and pride that we have um, because fear and pride will kill us. Uh, the other thing, the importance of having a primary care provider, uh, just like Dr. Robinson indicated, you know, um, we're looking at the trend, how much it changed from one year to the next. And so a lot of providers may have been trained that a level that's four and less is considered normal. However, if it goes from one to three, that's a significant increase in one year to the next. However, it's still less than four. And so it's important to know that you need to have a trend over time so you can really uh, see where uh, you may be becoming at risk. Now, I know some men may do the screening and they may have an abnormal screening. Uh, it would require them to get what we call more diagnostic, diagnostic testing. So, you know, Dr. Uh, Robinson talked about a biopsy. And so in this time period, when do and how do you incorporate your family in helping you make decisions about getting a biopsy or even if you get diagnosed with cancer, how important it is for family to talk and discuss about how to move forward? I'll jump in on that one. Um, I think it's very important to have your family involved because as Dr. Robinson mentioned, I think each um, uh, process brings on, you know, certain uh, possible, you know, um, disadvantages to it. You know, you have the one where it's just active surveillance where you do nothing, but when you do that, um, the way it was explained to me is that you still, you have to go back about every six months to have a biopsy done again, which means they're snipping at your prostate every six months. You're having to go back in on a regular basis or frequent basis to have your blood drawn, PSA. And then also that whole mental stress or strain on you of knowing that it's there and just it's like you're waiting, you know, to see, you know, is it going to get worse? So there, you know, things that go along with that as well as the uh, surgery. You know, some of the, the possible side effects being the incontinence or uh, the erectile dysfunction. And then with the radiation, you still you have some of the side effects with that. So it's important that you talk with your family and try to, you know, uh, figure out which way is going to be best for you, because everybody's a little bit different. So you really have to talk with your family and, and talk with your doctor uh, and try to, again, figure out which is going to be the best uh, way of going at it for you and your family. Well, mom, I'm a father of four and my kids are all gone. So my, my only friend I have and, why, and, and my wife is my wife and uh, so and my best friend as well. So she's always by my side. So <clears throat> to listen to the doctor, so if I forget something, she remembers and tells me. So I was glad that she was able to take, you know, always come with me and listen to the doctor right there in the office. So she was my partner and uh, I really appreciate it. So we all working together. In, in Demetrius? Well, <clears throat> on that answer, I was actually leaving it up to my, my fellow brethren who are actual prostate cancer survivors in terms of when they would actually tell the family um, about it. If, if, you know, I would have told my dad if, if you know, I, I really, the thing about it is I'm trying to put my mindset in when back in that time, we're talking about 19, we're talking about 1995, 1995. Um, he did tell us early, so I think the earliest about it was the best. And I, I guess I would in, 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 in encourage him, um, or I would have encouraged him to actually tell us at the beginning. So as a, as, a, as a family member of someone, when would they inform us? I hope that they would do it early in the process as much as possible so we can start mentally preparing and physically preparing on what's ahead. Excellent, thank you. And uh, another topic I'm gonna um, 
just briefly talk about is in, in 2010, there was two large prostate cancer studies that came out. And these two particular studies caused a lot of confusion uh, as far as um, being having prostate cancer screening being important or can save lives. Um, and in this partic these particular studies, the one particularly in the United States, there was only 4% of the men in this study, I think it was about 10,000 men, only 4% of the men were African-American men. And so we talk to people about, you know, the importance of participating in clinical trials because we need to make sure that we're represented because they'll make decisions based on some of these study results. And if we're not represented, um, we're not necessarily um, being, um, I would say uh, the, the recommendations are not necessarily for us. So when you talk about African-American men being twice as likely to die from prostate cancer and you tell us not to screen for it, you know, that gives a mixed message. And so I know Earl, um, I believe uh, you told me that you're in a research clinical uh, trial right now. What, what decisions did, did you make or how did you think about whether to participate in a clinical trial? Well, I, um, I received a, a notification um, said based on my, um, my surgery and everything, I would be a good candidate for the study. And so I, I, there's sometimes there's several to pick from. So I picked the one that was most appropriate. And it's, I, it's actually is already completed. One was to do a blood test. And the other one was to a, a x-ray of my heart. So I said, boy, you know, if I had to go take an x-ray, you know, it's gonna cost money. And I said, boy, I'd like to know what's going on with my heart. So I took it, you know, so I volunteered to take that, that, sort of, that, um, that study. And it's just completed right now. Excellent, thank you. And and you know, for people in the audience, you know, clinical trial is really another treatment option. And so, um, uh, I know things have been done historically. Um, however, a lot of things have changed over the years. We have a lot of protections in place to make sure that you know uh, everybody involved in the process is being ethical. Uh, and we're making sure that you're being treated appropriately. And specifically in, can in cancer clinical trials, there's no such thing as a placebo. You will always get a, at a minimum the standard of care. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits from being in the clinical trial. And so I know we're coming up close to time. Um, I'll ask each participant on the panel, what last words would you like to leave the audience? Well, based on Dr. Robinson's excellent presentation, I would say there's hope. There's constant um, studies for improvement, like I said, and every year there's always studies for improvement. So we, we live in a, a great time when my parents was alive. Uh, they, probably they're alive now if they have this medical treatment, but we're blessed to have a person like Dr. Moore who's sharing this as an African-American doctor with some privilege. So I said, let's take advantage of this situation. Let's get healthy. Thank you. Um, what I would like to say is, um, I wanna kind of go back to something Dr. Robertson said when he was uh, actually uh, promoting and being an advocate for um, early testing and, and you know trying to get checked early. Um, and Dr. Moore, something that you mentioned, uh, there was a, uh, a recommendation that came out in 2012 by the US Preventive Task Force where they actually recommended against uh, early screening for prostate cancer, but it talked about for average and risk men. And again, as African-American, we need to understand we are not average risk. We do have that higher risk factor uh, associated with us. Um, you know, They haven't determined exactly why, but we do. And so, uh, again, I have to agree with you, Dr. Moore, we do have to be very proactive in doing the early screening, doing the things, making sure we're talking with our primary care physician about this, making sure we have the PSA level checked um, so that we can try to get ahead of this, you know, because the earlier that you are diagnosed and the better the treatment options available and the higher likelihood that you will be a survivor. 
Thanks, Jeff. Um, first, I, I would love to thank uh, Dr. Robinson for that presentation. Um, and, and, I, and I like what he's putting actually in the chat because um, I, I would think part of the things I kept thinking about and hearing was the assumption is that every, every man um, has a primary care physician, which means that they have health insurance, which means that they potentially have a job and that may not necessarily be the case. So to actually put out in the in the chat to give a game plan on when you take your PSA at what age and how to and do it every two years. I think that's very important. Um, so we want to, we don't want to assume that everyone has a healthcare provider, which would be the <clears throat> optimal uh, situation. So um, don't want to make any man feel uncomfortable about when or knowing how if they don't have a relationship. But the more we keep providing this education and putting information like that, that pertinent information, especially in the chat, and I appreciate you doing it again. I wrote it down word for word because I'm actually going to say that to my fellow brethren, um, the, the better we can get. And of course, the, the, the fact that he talked about the technology getting better, I, I love that aspect as well um, to make it a lot easier on when and how we can be more effective in our screening. So that would be my last words. Yes, and I would say thank you all for participating and sharing your, your stories. And for any of the men that's here, even the women that are here that know men, if there's some men who would like to get screened for prostate cancer and need assistance, please reach out to our office. The last slide will have our contact information. We will help them uh, get the screening that they need, whether they have insurance or not. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay, sorry about that. And um, yes, definitely. So I have this picture here. This is a picture of myself. Uh, this was game six of the NBA finals in Milwaukee. Uh, next to this is uh, G. He's the owner of a barbershop in Milwaukee. And yes, that is the NBA uh, trophy. And so to the right is without him. This is a barbershop that I visit while I was there in Milwaukee. And this barbershop, as you see, there's the Milwaukee Bucks. It's set up like a basketball court. But I think one of the most important things is this area right here. In the back of this barbershop is a clinic. And so uh, at the time when I went there, they was doing COVID vaccination. I think, you know, it's my vision to really get barbers involved and making sure that we have an impact on men and their health. You know, we know that those are one of those places that we go very often. Uh, we have deep conversations, just men gathering. That's like more sort of like our secret place, our sacred place Like we go and talk and talk about all kinds of things. I think that we can have an impact on men's health, a positive impact by looking at barbershops. How can we incorporate health in barbershops? So I just wanted to throw that out to you all. If you know some barbers in your area, uh, we would like to train them on cancer screening so we can have those conversations to help connect people to care. Uh, right now, there was a lot of questions that was in the chat. Uh, thank you, Dr. Robinson, for answering those questions. Uh, if there's any questions that was not covered, we'll try to get those uh, questions to you. Um, here's our email uh, and a phone number. So we didn't get the opportunity to answer your questions or you have additional questions after this, please reach out to us. And here's some resources. The Office of Health Equity, uh, here's our phone number, here's the email address that you can get in contact with us. And I wanna bring attention to the Prostate Health Education Network, better known as FIN. And this is a, a program, uh, a lot of resources, just specifically for African-American men. They have on their website, they have all type of educational things that teach you about prostate cancer, screening, clinical trials. There's also plays that have been produced that really tell you a little bit about prostate cancer and what the family go through. So it's a great resource for you. Uh, also, there's cancer support groups in multiple areas. So if you're on this uh, call tonight and you're part of a prostate uh, cancer support group, if you'll put the name of your support group you know, in the chat, we'll collect that information because when we uh, talk to people throughout the state, no matter where they're located, we would like to uh, 
uh, give them information to connect to a support group. And we know that I've talked to several African-American men with prostate cancer and they have, they want to connect with somebody who can understand what they're going through. And so if it is a support, support group out there, we would like to connect them to that. The Men's Health Council of Durham County, um, Earl is a member as well as myself. Uh, and our goal is to help men become healthy. So these are some resources that are here for you. Some upcoming events that we have, the 24th of September, we're gonna have a, a event, a virtual event, and the focus is gonna be ovarian cancer because the month of September is prostate cancer as well as ovarian cancer awareness. Uh, so we're gonna have a great presentation for that. We will have a uh, oncologist to talk about ovarian cancer, a genetic counselor, as well as a survivor, ovarian cancer survivor that's gonna be participating in that event. October the 2nd from nine to noon, what's best for breast, all kind of experts that are in the field of breast and breast cancer, breast health, they're gonna be providing uh, a lot of information, short presentations about that. So we'll uh, like to invite you to that as well. That's virtual as also. And then on the 22nd of October or the 23rd of October, the Office of Health Equity, we do a, what we call community health ambassador training, where we teach people, community members, about cancer screening and education. So they can bring the information back to their community because they can reach people that we cannot reach. Um, and so that training will be offered is either on a Friday from one to five or on a Saturday morning from nine to one. And it's a four hour all virtual training. Here's our information if you would like to uh, have more information on that. I wanna thank you again for uh, uh, our meeting today. Uh, and we ask you to reach out to us if you need any assistance. Thank you all for your participation um, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Thank Good. you, our panelists. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Appreciate it. All right. Thank great you, job. Dr. Robinson. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night. Thank Thanks. you. Good night, everyone.